Well, despite a 136 to 121 loss last night against the Minnesota Timberwolves, yes, the Minnesota Timberwolves snapping a five game win streak for Dallas against Minnesota. Dallas clinches the five seed in the Western Conference, which is good for their highest seeding of the last decade. That's pretty good. It's, it's actually kind of incredible to look at this team now and realize that it finished with a better record and seeding than last year's team, considering where we felt like this team was back in January and where it is now. It's... It's still very much an uncertainty how high this team's ceiling is, not least of which just because we don't know exactly what we're going to get for Kristaps Porzingis. Is he going to be able to stay healthy in this rematch? Because yes, as the title below me shows, as the image over here shows, we have a rematch now with the Los Angeles Clippers. This is a very different Clippers team, however. We'll get into that in a minute, though. In the game, there, there was not a lot of fight from Dallas, I felt. This very much felt like a team that almost... I don't want to say they resigned themselves to the sixth seed, but things were really rough to start. Dallas missed its first 11 three-pointers. Meanwhile, Minnesota was cooking, absolutely cooking in this game. And they rushed out to a big lead at the end of the first quarter. Suddenly, it's 20-point deficit. And you're kind of like looking around thinking, you know, this team is like, they have how many losses? I, I don't even know off the top of my head, honestly, how many losses Minnesota had. Let me see. I actually want to confirm this. So they finished the regular season 23-49. and 49. Now, after they made the coaching change, they were a much better team. They started out something like 7-22, and 22, made a coaching change, and wound up basically one win for every two losses. It was something like 16-29 and 29 or 16-30, and 30, essentially, the rest of the way. Like, And off the top of my head, I don't know the basic math to know if I actually just added up the 72 games. But regardless, that's how they finished. They were a much better team after the coaching change. But this was an inexcusable loss from Dallas because, you know, with just a simple win, you clinch the five seed. And you don't have to worry about the rest of the, the hoodoo and all that of the other matchups and how they were going to fall because you got lucky, frankly. Portland and the Lakers took care of business. You ended in a three-way tie. The only reason, the only reason Dallas gets the five seed is because... Of those three teams, they are the one division winner. So the fact that the Spurs finally fell off allowed Dallas to stake this claim. And it's the first time in a long time I felt like the divisions really mattered. I've been in the camp saying, you know, hey, just do away with divisions. They're kind of pointless in today's NBA. No one cares about division titles. Well, I guess we have to care now, at least for the short immediate present because that's the reason Dallas is the five seed and not the six. Now, again, LA, Dallas held the tiebreaker against the Lakers, not against Portland. So when Dallas was looking like they were going to take an L in this game, which was unfortunately pretty early on, my strong indication was that you were going to see Portland move up because they were handling their business. However, the Lakers, excuse me, Lakers, the Clippers went next level. Their final three games were Charlotte, Houston, and Oklahoma City. Now, you look at that on paper and you say to yourself, oh, that's that's three wins. Like, you can't mess that up. It's, it's not that they wanted to mess it up, honestly. <laughs> they, they, they intentionally tanked because Dallas, they feel, is a better matchup for them. They won by 20, what, like 30 points basically against the Hornets. Then going up against pretty much two of the three worst records in the NBA, the Rockets and Thunder, benched their starters for the entirety of the fourth quarter. And, and, you know, and they had several guys that didn't play at all in that Rockets game anyway. They made sure they lost to Houston. That was 122-115 loss. Because had they taken care of their business in these last three games, they could have climbed as high as the two seed. And 
And then they go against the tanking of all tanking teams in Oklahoma City this year. Uh, at least post-All-Star break, absolutely team tank. And they found a way to lose to Oklahoma City. Like, I, I know Thunder fans who joke that they are, they've never been less excited to see a game winner for them, essentially, than uh, Poku, because that <laughs> messed up the tanking just a little bit, just a little tweak of the odds there as they end the regular season does OKC with the 117-112 win over the Clippers. That's, that's pretty impressive that L.A. wanted Dallas that bad because in these circumstances, I, I think it's more about who they wanted to avoid, honestly. They don't want to have to face the Lakers any earlier than they have to, and so I think they like the idea of facing them in the second round, assuming they get there. And they wanted to face instead someone like Dallas or Portland in that first round. Now, I've said for a while I think Portland's a first-round exit this year. I could be wrong about that, but I just don't think it's as good of a team as we've seen from the Blazers the past two years. And, you know, looking at Dallas, while Dallas is a better team than they were last year, so were the Clippers. This is a very, very different Clippers team than we've seen at other times like the the last year's team is very very notably different uh from this one you have you have uh Kawhi Leonard still doing his thing still one of the best players in the world you have Paul George who has had a pretty good year even though he continues to and I think somewhat justly so get a lot of uh flack for his his failures and his shortcomings pretty much until he really, really balls out in a postseason again, which he hasn't done since Indiana. He's not going to shake that label. And even still a very good two way player there. You have other guys as well who frankly, they, they upgraded in many respects. Yes, they lost Montrez Harrell and he was a thorn in the Maverick side last year. But they added Serge Ibaka, who came back the last two games of the regular season for them. And 19 minutes off the bench for them last night, he had 12-7-2. Not a great shooting night, only 4 of 10 from him. But he is still a very viable weapon. He's a guy I've said for two or three years now I would like to see in Dallas. But it just has not been in the cards. Instead, he's in L.A. And I think he's going to be a problem of sorts. We know that with Dallas and how they've shaked things up, Rick Carlisle even intimate, intimated re recently that they like having two bigs out there. They like having uh, KP and Dwight on the floor. Well, there's a little bit of a problem there. Yes, the Clippers have Zubats, but they also have a lot more rangy guys, right? Marcus Morris is going to really try to pull KP away from the basket with his ability to stretch the floor. Now, when Marcus is on defense, he's going to be guarding Luka. We know that. We absolutely anticipate there still being some chippiness there and some major storylines of that nature because, obviously, he got KP. He baited KP into getting ejected in the first game of the series last year. He had the whole thing where he stepped on Luka's injured ankle and... Um, you know, caused them to kind of tweak it again. And then obviously the, the blow to Luca's head in game six uh, ended up not mattering that he would have been probably facing a suspension for game seven. I don't remember if he had any punishment carry over into the following series against Denver, but that was still a major thing that if the series had gone one more game, you could have had a major weapon for LA who was torching the Mavericks that year out of the equation. And that would have been huge. Now, I think they're going to try and draw KP away from the basket. And I, I've, I've seen a couple other people kind of make this point as well. It's really going to test how loyal Dallas wants to be to its, we like two bigs on the floor, you know, picture. And LA is also a team that leads the NBA in three-point shooting this year. I think Locked On Mavs had the actual specifics of this stat. So shout out to, I think it was actually specifically Isaac Harris, I want to say, that had it. But the, the Clippers are the number one three-point shooting team in the NBA this year based on percentage. And the Mavericks, conversely, 
uh, give up. I think they're 19th in terms of the the looks they give up in that regard. So it's like the Mavericks allow for a lot of good looks and the Clippers knock them down better than any team in the league. The Mavericks like they by their own admission like to go with the too big front uh in that regard where you have Dwight and KP on the floor. The Clippers while they do have a little bit of size in that regard as well, they are going to want to spread you out. So KP might be a little more vulnerable in the series this year, even than last year. Just something to take note of there. We'll see. But in this, it's basically going to boil down to, can Kristaps Porzingis recapture the, the form he had previously in the bubble? Because in the series last year, he bar- you know, he gets ejected in, in game one. I think like 20 minutes played. Very eh numbers in that start. Game two, he was much better. Game three, he was a beast. Luca actually was dealing with the ankle in game three. Missed essentially, I think, the whole fourth quarter. And even still, you still had KP I- I have his best game. It was his final game of the season. But it was his best game, I think, as well, just because of the stage and the performance. It was something like a, a 33, 34-point game in that regard. I, I actually wish I had pulled up the stats here in front of me beforehand. But it's a, it's a very strong performance from KP to close the year, and that's why it was frustrating that the knee ended his season. They said the meniscus tear, I believe they told us later, they think it occurred in a, in a contact play in game one, which is interesting because... He was much better in game two and three, but maybe, you know, we, we know a narrative of KP as well is that, you know, he can, he can go out there and he can look great, but as soon as he has to start, it's a war of attrition. And as you get two or three games down the line in a physical series, it's going to start showing that wear on him. And so whether the knee was getting gradually worse throughout games two and three last year, or it just got to a point where he was just like, yeah, okay, now that I'm not 100%, the damage, even if it hasn't gotten worse, it's more cumbersome now. It's more limiting in what I'm able to do with it. And so that's when they had to do it. I don't know. I'm speculating on that. But it's a it's a concern. If you have KP balling out like it's the bubble again, and you have Luka playing like he played last year, obviously we know the game winner in game, I think it was game four, the game winner over Reggie Jackson, then you've got a chance. I, I said many times, if KP doesn't go down last year, I think Dallas beats the Clippers. We got to see what happens because it's not the same Clippers team as we said. Now you have Rajon Rondo in the mix. Montrez Harrell is gone. And instead, you have Serge Ibaka. Like, they have a new head coach. You don't know that you're going to get, uh, you know, pandemic Paul or whatever pandemic P as far as Paul George's playoff nickname you don't know that you're going to get that and if if you get a Paul George struggling as much as he did last year against Dallas I feel better about our chances for sure but if he bounces back in any kind of way then that's going to be a tough tough matchup still I still don't like this matchup as much as I liked the possibility of getting Denver. I just don't. I think Denver, even though they have the MVP this year and by all, you know, all indications in Jokic, I still think that without Murray, that was a more vulnerable team. It's like, hey, you have one undeniable superstar. We have one undeniable superstar. And a guy who, if he's there and healthy is another very good player, another star player. Our our collection at that point, to me, would have matched up better with Denver. But alas, no point lamenting it at this point. It's, uh, it's a done deal. You got the Clippers. And I don't know, man. Last year I said my fear was going to be Clippers in five and it ended up being six. And really, with the exception of just, I want to say, Game 5, Dallas really, really looked like they were capable of taking that series. Like They looked like they were right there, and it was just a matter of like 
War of Attrition, we don't have any of our guys, right? They didn't have Brunson. They didn't have Dwight Powell. Willie Cauley-Stein sat out the restart. He opted out the restart in the bubble um, because his child was being born. Um, and, you know, at that time, it was an even more uncertain landscape at the time because of the pandemic. So you had all these things that made it more vulnerable, the roster. And Trey Burke, you went and picked him up right before the bubble, and there he was having to be a major part of your team. Now, I still like Trey Burke as a, as a role player. I, I think he can give you good games, but you can't rely on him as much game after game as Dallas has had to at times. And so you saw all of that and how just limited they were in the front court. Obviously, KP goes down, and it just didn't feel like you had the firepower to hold out. Now it's a different situation, right? J.J. Redick... Missed the last three games of the season with the heel. I, I'm curious to see his availability. Thankfully, he does have until next weekend, basically, because now we got to go through all the play-in stuff, which should be interesting. And Dallas, thankfully, doesn't have to take part in that. So we'll have to see what his availability is once the, the playoffs start. Because essentially, last year, a, a key, key player for you was Seth Curry. Seth Curry is now gone on the number one seeded Philadelphia 76ers in the East. So with that change, you're now trying, you have to, you know, not replicate, but make up for his production from that series. He shot over 40% from three in that series. Very good. Speaking of 40% from three, Maxi Kleba, by way of not playing in the season finale, got a $150,000 contract bonus for shooting over 40% from three this year. I think he shot like 40.6%. Going in, he just, if he had played in the game, he just would have had to avoid it going 0 of 6 from three, and he would have hit that bonus. But he ended up being sat out because of Achilles soreness. So we'll see his availability. Again, good that Dallas has a week now. But Dallas is largely a very healthy roster all things considered right now. Now, Luka's usage rate and everything has been crazy high. It's good that he's going to get this rest over the next few days. But Dallas is sitting health-wise in a much, much better position as it stands right now than they were uh, this time last year. So we'll see. Dallas, if you look at... Uh, it, it, Rangers King always points this out. If you look at Dallas since the the storm that delayed the season... Uh, for the Mavericks, delayed like a week worth of games because I think it backed into like the All-Star break or something, if I recall. God, that feels like a eternity ago. That sh- that shook it up. Shook it up? Am I a writer? Sometimes I wonder. That shook things up to the point where you were able to come back and you were able to have some more traditional style practices that have not been as available to teams this year because of health and safety protocols. Um, and so when the team was actually able to have some very defensive-centric practice sessions, their ratings started to get better. This is all after that rough, rough start where they had that, like, 4-14 and 14 stretch or whatever obscene, you know, performances they had um, when they were missing so many guys. This is when the Mavericks turning point started to come. And from that time, Dallas has actually been top 10 in both offense and defense as far as efficiency. Now, if you look at the season as a whole, obviously you got to count all the stuff before then and when they weren't able to address it and when they were dealing with uh, so many guys out due to COVID and all that. Then you have a situation where you're looking at it and you're like, yeah, the team's basically defensively similar to where they were last year. If you look at like their standings, It's the same. But again, Rangers King added important context to that, that uh, added, you know, it changed your perspective a little bit. Like defenses in general across the league have not been as good this year as they were last year. If you look at the the top defensive ratings and stuff from last year compared to this year, it's like the number one this year would have been fifth last year. So everything stepped back on that front. And so the Mavericks, while their rating might look the same, if you just look at like where they ranked in the league, like something like 19th, it's different if you look at it from the spectrum of, okay, but are they improved from last year on that front? Not so much. 
<laughs> but it, if you look at it in that regard, because like I said, everything steps back a little bit. But if you look at it for how they've done post All Star break, they have been the most improved team in terms of their net rating. So there's there's been good with this team. The problem is there's also been the bad and the perplexing. Last night was a perplexing. I, yeah, they got the five seed, but you're not going to convince me that that was better for them to not try as hard and to basically get beat down by a really bad, not a terrible, but a really bad Minnesota team. A Minnesota team that actually, if anything, only served to hurt their draft chances in the lottery by winning that game. That's just, that's not going to be a viable <laughs> a viable argument to me there. So you look at that, and you look at the, like the Sacramento games, for instance. The, the Memphis game in the second half, they just ran out of steam, it looks like. But you see these different examples, and it raises red flags because you say, all right, where does this team stand? What I can say on the bright side is that the only team of those you could even conceivably still match up with is Memphis, who's in the play-in tournament. However, Memphis is the 10 seed, and so you're not going to have to worry about facing Memphis. That's right, right? 10 seed standings. No, they're the 9 seed. Excuse me, Spurs are the 10 seed. As soon as I said it, I was like, that doesn't sound right. So they're the 9 seed. That's the only conceivable rematch you could get with one of those teams, and I don't think that's especially likely. So more than likely, if the problem has been that you're looking down at some of these other teams. You're you're not taking them seriously because you assume, hey, our guys are better than their guys and, you know, we can just turn it on and it'll be fine, but then you fail to turn it on and you end up taking a bad loss that you really can't explain. That's why you have a below 500 record against teams with a below 500 record. And conversely, when you want to take a team seriously, you can go out there and play against the Nets and jump all over them and suddenly you have a very good record when facing teams with a record over 500. That's great. That part of it's great. The other part of it's not. And so the fact that you're going to face like the Clippers, the Clippers, like I said, they could have been the two seed. They could have been as high as the two seed, but they basically made the evaluation that they liked the idea of Dallas or Portland, and they threw to their final two games. That's really, really interesting to me that they went that route because the Nuggets have that there. Um, same record with the Nuggets. So uh, Nuggets must have the head-to-head -head in that regard. But it's... Uh, let's see. So the Suns ended up with the two seed. And the Suns... So, I mean, I guess it was in play, but the Suns did end up four games ahead. So I don't know. Suns would have had to lose and the Clippers would have had to win. But even still, the Clippers basically are making the calculated move that they like Dallas or Portland as their matchup. And, you know, I said I didn't think many teams were going to vie to get Dallas, like that they were going to say, like, yep, that's who we want. And they might have preferred to have the Blazers. I don't think they wanted any part of the Lakers at any time. But I do think the Clippers looked at it and said, yeah, we'd rather have maybe Portland of the two but we're happier taking on one of these teams in the first round than we are having to take on like the Lakers or, uh, you know, whatever else comes out of this. So I don't know, man. It's, it's a frustrating feeling in the sense that like, I, I still can't explain the regular season has literally wrapped up now. 72 games are in the books. I still look at this Mavericks team and I don't fully I don't fully understand what they are and what they aren't. If you look post All-Star break, they've been much better, but they still have some of those head-scratching moments in there. And so while they don't look like the train wreck they were at times prior to the All-Star break, they did claim a better record and a higher seeding than they did last year. They did drastically improve after the All-Star break, and if it, it's one of those things where in a more typical season and structure, that win percentage would have played out to be, you know, a much better team as well. 
again, if this was if this was a regular year, an 82 game schedule, you would have had 10 games left. Mavericks are 42 and 30, 12 games over 500. Like this would have been, you know, from a win percentage perspective, it is the best record the team has put together in I don't it's the highest playoff seeding in 10 years. But it might be the best regular season record this team's put out in some time, like five, six years at least. But I don't know, man. I'm 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 excited to see playoff basketball again. The rematch with the Clippers is juicy, even if the Clippers themselves are a very different team than last year. I'm excited it's going to be at the AAC. The fact that you're going to have Luka playing in Dallas and not in a bubble in Orlando. You're going to have some fans there. All of that is awesome. I'm just curious to see which Mavericks team shows up and specifically which Kristaps Porzingis shows up. Because when the dude is there, when he's dialed in, you saw it even in last year's series, he was wrecking the Clippers. He had two very strong games, I want to say, I know game three was strong, but I want to say he was also very good in game two. In game two of the series last year, KP had 23-7 and seven, uh, in 36 minutes. So nice numbers, not blow you away numbers by any means. But as I said in game three, he was significantly better. That was a very different vibe. KP bounced back in game three in 38 minutes, gave 34 points, and was 11 of 18 from the field, also added in 13 rebounds. Very, very strong performance from him there. For those who care about the plus minus, he was, however, still a minus two. Granted, Luka was a minus 14 in that game. That was a four of 14 night for Luka. Again, that's him dealing with the ankle, plays less than 30 minutes because of the ankle. And that was a big part of that win, KP closing it out. So if you have your, at least close to the height of his powers, KP, maybe you've still got a chance here. I feel about as good about this series. I feel better than I did last year because, as I said, going into last year, everything we had seen in the regular season matchup with the Clippers told me this was a 5 game series maybe if we hoped and prayed we can get to six games we did but we at least looked a lot more competitive in the series than i thought we would um and this year i think that you still have the potential for it to only be a five game series but i think it is more likely that it's going to be a six game series the question is are you able to overcome it i do think this is the most i I think this is a more capable dallas team of advancing but I need to see what they're able to do. What adjustments can they make? Because the Clippers are not a good matchup at this point. They weren't last year either. But you need to make some adjustments because their strengths are still their strengths. And their weaknesses that they had on their roster last year, I think they've largely addressed the Clippers have. And so this is a better Clippers team than last year. I still feel that. And while you're a better Dallas team and you're healthier, a better Clippers team than last year, which I think very much underestimated Dallas going into that series, is still a dangerous thing to contend with. So we'll see, man. Later in the week, I'm going to be doing a full preview of this matchup with Inny and Duca. So look for that. And uh, yeah, we'll get to it when we get to it. We'll have post game. Maybe not streams, but certainly videos to put out. So if you like the video, don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. Listen.